Good evening, my friends. This is the Grim Flare. I hope you're all doing very well tonight. We've got some more Golgari gameplay for you, and uh, before I get right into it, I would just like to say something that I that I usually say at the end of videos, but for those of you who don't always make it to the very end, thank you so much to everybody who watches this channel, um, especially if you like, share, subscribe, um, anything you do that can help grow this channel, even if it's just views, is most appreciated. And I would like to issue a special thank you once again to my uh, to my two patrons. My my Patreon is a is very new, just uh, less than two days old at this point, and we've already got SV and Robbie supporting the channel. So thank you both so much, my friends, and thank you to everyone else out there who is watching and who is enjoying the content, all the positive feedback. It means a lot to me. And um, if you would like to subscribe, if you're not a subscriber, that would be a big, big help. And if you'd like to check out my Patreon page, the link to that is in the description below. So without further ado, let's play some Golgari midrange and let's look at our hand. We have lost the die roll, so we are on the draw. That is uh, never ideal, but beyond that we have the kind of platonic ideal of three lands versus four spells. This is really good in a blind game one. We have two pieces of interaction. We have our premier two drop threat, and we have a Liliana of the Veil, who's kind of both interaction and threat. Therefore, I'm a huge fan of this hand. This hand is actually pretty incredible without knowing what we're up against, at least. That could change everything, but for now, it looks pretty good. Our lands, you know, three fetch lands is a little strange. It's it's highly unusual, but it certainly lets us, you know, get basics if we need basics, get duels if we need duels. Um, might be a little more painful than average, but I think we can live with that. Our opponent will keep seven, and they will start us off by cracking a Wooded Foothills for a Sacred Foundry into Monastery Swift Spear. Okay, well, this appears to be Burn, and the damage we're taking from our lands is now... I'm, I'm not quite so cavalier about that anymore, but hey. Um, nothing to it but to do it, and we're going to go get a Swamp. And we are going to open up on a Thought Seize. Of course, this is very bad compared to where Inquisition would be in this spot. But Thought Seize is, you know, still a card we're, we're going to play, and it will do at least some good, even though it's a pretty poor use of one mana against Burn. So we see a fairly stacked hand, but one that is stuck on one mana. So the first thing to do is consider taking a one mana card. They've got a pair of Lightning Bolts. It's obviously, you know just the most iconic card in burn they're going to pump the swift spear but i don't think we can really rely on them not hitting a second land ever and if they do we can weather two lightning bolts you know so i think we have to take a more powerful card here boros charm is always a nice take but i think eidolons are a little bit harder for us to fight through they just tax you and then demand removal it's just they're just pretty backbreaking a lot of the time. Now, so I'm I'm inclined to take an Eidolon even though they have a redundancy with a second one, um, partially because it just is that strong, especially on the play, and partially because this Boros Charm is another high value target, right? But if they rip another land off the top, we can brutality next turn. You know they're gonna play it tap out for an Eidolon, so we can brutality kill the Swift Spear, take the Boros Charm. And then we are potentially on our way to stabilizing. That said, this is still a pretty scary start from them. And uh, yeah, we're definitely taking the idol on there. And let's see what the opponent gets. Well, they're just bolting us in the main phase, so it does not look like they've found a land. And we will take five. That's, uh, that's still pretty rough, but... So... Go ahead and fetch up a basic land. And yeah, we're going to go all in on this Collective Brutality. Escalating twice, this is the dream against Burn, right? When when you can kill them, kill their Swift Spear while they're tapped out so they can't um, get it a prowess trigger in response. You get to drain them for two and you get to take a peek at the hand. So 
Boros Charm and Lightning Bolt we knew about. Skullcrack is a new one, and Skullcrack is a good one, but Boros Charm is still the highest value take there, pretty clearly in my opinion. So right now, we're hoping they brick on a land, and they don't. They, they hit their Inspiring Vantage. So they, they stumbled for a turn, but now they are back at it. And we draw a Tireless Tracker. So we, we already drew one, and I, I didn't really address that. The, the card is obviously an all-star in this deck, but certainly does not shine against Burn. Um, so that's one of the cards that we pitched to our Brutality, the other one being a Treetop Village, um, simply because we wanted to give ourselves the option to play a Liliana this turn. So if they had continued to break on land, playing the Liliana, ticking her up, that would have been pretty great. But they found a land, they found an Eidolon, so what do we do now? Do we play the Lily and tick her down? Well, that's certainly an option, right? That's certainly an option. It means we don't have to get anything out of our hand. But you know what? I kind of like the Tarmogoyf here. We're going to take two and we have not answered the Eidolon, so that feels pretty bad. But here's the thing. Tarmogoyf is a 5-6. That is an insane body right now, because remember, the Eidolon taxes them too. Now, they're at 15, so... This might seem a little bit crazy to start thinking about, but, you know, there might come a point in this game where they are, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of locked out by their own Eidolon. That can happen to burn players. They're going to draw land, so they're c capable of a double spell turn at any point from here on out. Still have just the two cards in hand. Ooh, Scavenging Ooze is an interesting draw. Okay. So once again, we're faced with kind of the same dilemma. Do we want a Lily and Tick down, or even Lily and, and Tick up? But that doesn't feel good anymore, because now we, we're not getting anything out of their hand. They can double spell us in response. That's pretty bad. So that's pretty much off the table. We can still play a Liliana, Edict away the Eidolon, get in for five, and they're on a two-turn clock after that. Then we're at eight. They've got six damage in hand. You know, that's... That's potentially winnable, but I think the odds are a little bit against us. So, the, uh, you know, Tireless Tracker is simply not an option to play here. The other option, of course, is Scavenging Ooze, which might demand some attention. It can gain some life if they leave it alone. So I think what we're going to do first is just get in with a Tarmogoyf. We're going to get really aggressive, because if they take this, they go down to 10. Two more spells puts them at 6. You know, their their life total is definitely not going to be high after this, that is for sure. And then I think we're going to go on the Scoos plan. Now they do have answers to it, and we're going to take two to play it. But if they have to point a spell at this, that's obviously pretty good for us. It's going to tax them for two, and then it's three that's not going to our face. Um, if they don't point a spell at it, they cannot attack with the Eidolon. So... This is honestly a pretty good play, even though it seems a little bit weird that we've passed up two chances in a row to deal with the Eidolon. I think that this the sheer size of our Tarmogoyf is allowing us to take this line. All right, they're going to bolt the use. So here I could fetch in a response, get a forest, and eat something and, and stay at 8 life. I don't know. You know, that's that's not bad, but not getting double black is also not great, right? So I just kind of left it alone. See what our opponent does. And look, they, they kind of feel they're locked out of attacking because if they attack, we get to untap and crash in for five. And then, you know, then we can just maybe play defense and, and they're kind of locked out and we can wait to, to maybe draw a Tassig or something like that. I don't quite know, but... Certainly, they feel a little bit, a little bit gun shy there in terms of, uh, in terms of attacking, and we find another Tarmogoyf. So, is it possible that we're just going to be able to keep playing spells through this Eidolon and win, because Tarmogoyf is so good? Well, I guess the first thing to do is attack, because they they might feel that they're at risk of being locked out. Maybe they'll take this block, and that's honestly kind of good for us too. All right, they took the block. We don't mind that, so we're at eight. And so we could play the Liliana, but we have to fetch to do that. So we go to seven, we tick up, 
and they can just still bolt and skull crack us in response. So I don't think that accomplishes anything. Let's just play another Tarmogoyth. They're dead on board next turn. Little surprise that they didn't end step something, even even just that skull crack for three. But wow, that's it. That's it. We just got there. So we were dead if they had skull cracked us on the end step. We were dead to a burn spell off the top. So it's not like we had that game sewn up or anything. That was a very scary draw step, but it didn't do that. Didn't do it for him. And we got there on the sheer power, power of Tarmogoyf. Now, that is a very, very unusual game against Burn, where we were at f they we had them at 15 when we started attacking with our Tarmogoyf. And then we just kept playing cards into an Eidolon without answering it and ended up winning, like, while they had gas in hand. That is just a very, very unusual line. You cannot usually pull that off. In a situation like this, like even a couple triggers from Eidolon, in, unless you're already pretty far ahead and or they just draw air off the top, the Eidolon triggers will just put you away. They'll just make sure that, that they close out the game. But the the fact that Tarmogoyf was a 5-6, and then the fact that they kind of had to deal with the Scoos, otherwise it was going to gain a bunch of life, and then the fact that we had another Tarmogoyf after it, like... Almost no other draws in our deck would have been ones that we were happy to just play into Eidolon. We would maybe have sandbagged them, or we maybe would have had to pivot to the Lily into Edict plan, and who knows how that would have gone. But Tarmogoyf getting aggressive and stealing the game, frankly. Like, they had a really strong hand. They only missed a land drop for one turn. Even that one turn that they missed, they still got to hit us for five with a Bolt and a 2-3 uh, Swifty. And, you know, we we had granted one of our best cards in Collective Brutality, but we also had Thoughtseize and Triple Fetchland. It's not like we were particularly well set up against Burn, but and we were on the draw too. But we still stole the game, Power of Tarmogoyf, and also the power of knowing when it is a realistic, um, realistically good decision to turn the Tarmogoyf sideways in a situation like that. They, th like, I would wager that our first attack didn't phase them at all. They're like, well, that Tarmogoy is pretty big, but yeah, I'm just I'll just go to 10, that's fine. And then all of a sudden, it's like they cast a spell, they're at 8, and now the Tarmogoy is really threatening. And, uh, man, anyway, a pretty unique game in my opinion, but, um, but we got there, and we'll be on the draw again, which is never where you want to be for game 2. But I think we can still get there, we do get better post-side. Speaking of sideboard, I will not be showing the sideboard tech here because I've already done that on this channel, but I will link to that below. Do note, if you're watching that, that we no longer have Obstinate Bailoth on the side, so that's a, a life gain card that we no longer get to bring in here. And we also have another Liliana the Last Hope in the main deck from when I made that tech, and she's, of course, pretty poor in the matchup. So we have... Maybe maybe we're going to bring out that Lily and we have two new cards to bring in because we have to bring in something for her and then something else instead of the Bailoth. And I, I think just the pair of Fulminator Mages are probably what you want here. They're not very impressive, but they are two twos. They can trade with a lot of their stuff. Some progressions, we can keep them off of white mana. If uh, They're a little more appealing if it's a Naya deck and we can keep them off green more easily than white. Um it might not also be the worst possible decision in the world to play a Languish just because it is a 4-drop that kills Eidolon without triggering its uh, its uh, triggered ability. So I, while I don't think Languish is necessarily recommended, it's, it's not the worst thing in the world to bring in. But yeah, we don't really have anything better than, than Bailoth in our sideboard, sadly, for this matchup. But I still think we're pretty good against Burn overall. Um, better than almost any other BGX variant. I will I will definitely stand by that. So let's go to game two and see how we do. All right, my friends, game two on the draw against Burn, and our opponent has kept seven both games. That's not what we want to see. You know, Burn doesn't mulligan all that well. In general, we play, prey on decks when they mulligan because we're trading resources so heavily and, and all that good stuff, but they're not going to... 
they're not going to uh, maul for us, so a little bit rude from them, but we'll have to live with it. Now, what do we think about our hand? Well, the land is relatively painless, like, we... We just have too much of it. Like, the only reason it's painless is because we have these extraneous lands that we don't need anytime soon and won't be very painful because we don't need them early. Like, you know, and, and this hand is very underwhelming. Engineered Explosives is not a haymaker in the matchup like it is a lot of the time when you bring it in. It's just in here because we we have worse cards to bring out, basically. And Ditto Trophy. So we have two cards, two spells that are on the weaker side of the spectrum as far as what's in our deck and we have five lands i mean two of them are, are creature lands that's good but i think we can do better with a six all right this is technically better but not by much it's actually very similar the land is is totally painless so that's good fatal push i guess is better than engineered explosives probably on average but we still have the trophy we still don't have anything great but going to five is really not ideal. And in, in this hand functions, we get a scry. We're on the draw. We get to see some cards. Yeah, there's another land, you know, as nice as, as it is to leave a land on top with your scry for Goblin Guide, that only applies if you actually need the land, right? Like, we don't need the land, so we just have to bottom that. They're going to fetch Foundry and Lava Spike. Okay. And we have another land. Okay, not very exciting. We've got to play the Quagmire there so we can Fatal Push next turn. And let's see what they got. Another Lava Spike. Another One Lander. Okay, well, at least they're not going to start Eidolon taxing us quite yet. So we'll just deploy another Creature Land and pass, holding up uh, another Fatal Push. We've We've got two in hand now. That could be good. Um, that said, I, I think burn players will sometimes side out some number of creatures against us just because we are so removal heavy, so hopefully these won't be rotting in hand all game. Doesn't look like it because they're main phasing of fetch land. And they do have an idol on, sure. Okay, so obviously we have the mana up to fatal push this thing, but I don't know if we want to because let's say, you know, the reason we would want to is if we're going to draw a pretty much exactly Tarmogoyf off the top or or a Liliana. Those are the two draws that I'm really going to want to play out on curve without protection. Like, I'm not going to play a Tracker next turn on three, probably, if I get one. I'm not going to play a Scavenging Ooze without, you know, without a bunch of mana ready to, to activate it a few times. So... We can push this thing now, and then we untap, and if we draw Tarmogoyf, great. We go Goyf, Village, pass. If we draw Liliana, we go Forest, Tick Up, pass. Um, but if we don't draw either of those two things, I'm kind of just going to play a land and pass anyway, and this makes it possible that they will have to tax themselves. Like, if they have another creature to play, they have to obviously play that main phase, we let the tax resolve, then we kill the idol on one of the tax. So that's the reason not to fatal push in this end step. You could still go either way, but I chose not to. I also kind of had a feeling we weren't going to draw anything good there, right? It's just another creature land. Now, let me take that back. Treetop Village is always good. I don't, I don't want to say this card is not good. It's always good. I just, uh, I just don't particularly, you know, want to see another land at that exact spot. But hey. What are you going to do? So they're going to attack. Yep, we've, we'll have fatal push this thing. We certainly don't want to take any hits from it. Getting uh, taxed is bad enough. Opponent's got another one. All right. Well, that's pretty bad for us. But now I, I am going to end step fatal push it just because I can, even if I don't have a good draw, I can at least untap and start swinging. And wow, land upon land upon land. Not good. Not good, folks, but hey, at least we have the treetop village. It's going to get in for three. You, you know, it's basically our version of Lava Spike, so take that. And we'll play the other treetop village, and we will pass. Um, yeah, so our opponent just 
passes. They've got five cards in the hand. I'm not really sure what they could be. We draw Engineered Explosives, which, as I said when we saw it in our opener, is not great, but it's a spell, at least. That's progress. So I'm going to fire up the Treetop Village, and I'm, I guess, expecting this to eat some kind of a bolt, but that's actually pretty good for us because we literally have four man lands on the field. We're going to be able to keep firing them up. And I guess if they don't bolt it, that's also good because we just get to do three when we would not have done much otherwise. Treetop's going to make it across. All right, it's 10 all. We're going to play a forest. And we're going to we're going to pass. So there were a couple options here, right? We could play an engineered explosives on one just to get it down and just to kind of get that under an Eidolon tax and then have a, you know, only have to have two mana held up in future turns to activate it rather than in a future turn having to pay one and then pay two, right? So that was an option. But the fact that they have just have five cards in hand, and they're not making land drops anymore, and they didn't do anything this whole turn, makes me think they've got to have some sideboard cards chilling in hand. And it occurred to me that maybe they brought in... Um, I guess not Destructive re destructive Revelry, because they haven't shown me green, but I guess Wear and Tear would be the card. I don't know that that should be in against us, but I'm trying to think what they what could they have. So maybe it's a Wear and Tear, so I don't want to expose my EE. The other option here is I could Assassin's Trophy the Sacred Foundry, take them off of white. That's definitely an option. But again, I'm not really sure what they have. I decide to just hold up the trophy for for now and see, but the, but that's definitely an option. All right, so they are going to play on our end step. I guess I spoke a little bit too soon there, but but sure, skull crack us. We're down to seven. That's fine. Still happy to hold up trophy here. And they're just going to pass. Well, now I'm going to take them off white, and they don't have a response. I was dreading a Boros charm in a response. That would have put us to three, and then we're dead to any other burn spell. That would have been pretty bad. But the fact that we're able to take them off white is actually pretty huge here because it just means a lot of their other draws have the potential to be dead, at least for now. <laughs> As do ours, we can draw almost nothing but land this game. It is so fortunate that we have these treetop villages to, as a monosync and as a proactive play. And that's what we're going to do. We're just going to fire up both the villages and see what happens. Coming across for six. I mean, the clock is real. Yeah, they've got a bolt for one of them. That's pretty much necessary for them at this point, but it never feels bad when a bolt is pointed at your board and not at your face in this matchup. And uh, yeah, one of them still gets through. So it is seven to seven, and they get right back onto white mana. So that's a little rough, but I guess our trophy is, wasn't really hitting anything anyway. So sure. And they're still going to just pass, okay? Four cards in hand. We draw our best card in the matchup, Collective Brutality. Well, that's pretty great. So what do we do here? Well, I don't want to get my Brutality skull cracked. I guess that's the most important thing we have to play around right now. So maybe our opponent has something for two mana that they'll that they'll have to play to handle this treetop village if they want to handle that. So I, I suppose the thing to do first is to fire this up and see what they do. Okay, they're gonna path to exile, sure. So we get to get <laughs> thin out our deck a little bit, which at this point is, is pretty necessary. And uh yeah, we have to risk getting blown up by Skullcrack here. Um, definitely happy to just hopefully drain them for two, and even if we can't, we can poach a card out of their hand. Wow, this is the last thing I expected to happen. I was worried about poaching... I was worried about getting Skullcracked in a response, but consoling myself that we could take another spell, and the opposite has happened. We whiff with our Collective Brutality, which must be a first 
in the history of BGX versus Burn when they've got three spells in hand and none of them can be taken by Brutality on turn seven. That's a little weird. And uh, but, but we do get to drain them for two, which is pretty nice. We pitched a f uh, fetch land, which is, you know, nothing lost there. So they have double ensnaring bridge and a rest in peace. Yeah, they've got all the sideboard cards, but that's the thing about playing Burn is, you know, sometimes your sideboard cards are not they're not burn spells, and that can be pretty bad. We're up at a nice semi-healthy life total now of 9. And once more, we could have played Forest into EE there. But if at this point, if our opponent finds a creature, they play an Ensnaring Bird, sure. If, that, if our opponent finds a creature, they kind of have to play defense with it. Like, our Quagmires are, are going to be getting in, uh, at least for another turn. So... I hold the forest in hand just, you know, for collective brutality, for tireless tracker, uh, maybe for Liliana of the Veil, all that good stuff. This is an insane amount of land draws. I, I'm almost tempted to go back at the end and see how many lands we've drawn in a row, but we still, we've lost two brave treetop villages, but now we have Hiss and Quagmire to carry the torch and get in for... Sadly, only two and not three, but hey, we'll still take it. Play another land. Thought about deploying the Engineered Explosives. The same narration I've been employing here was kind of going on in my head at the time, and yeah, I'm still just going to hang on to it. Still just going to hang on to it. They have a Goblin Guide. And they have a Rest in Peace. Sure, so they had a two-spell turn. And they've got one unknown in hand and another ensnaring bridge. And like I said, the goblin kind of has to play defense here. We draw a tireless tracker, so we are rewarded for hanging on to a land. So what do we do here? One, two, three, four, five, six. We'll have seven lands after we play the tracker and the forest. So. They're down to two in hand. Next turn, they might be able to empty their full hand if they have a one mana spell in hand and they draw a land and that's untapped. For example, they can empty their hand and then we're shut off of attacking and our outs are Maelstrom Pulse for the bridges or another Brutality for the drain. So I think we have to get an attack in while we still can and put them to one. So therefore the sequencing here is Tracker into land for our clue, and then we'll fire up the Quagmire. You know, they might block with the Goblin Guide, and that's fine too, right? We'll see what they do. Alright, I guess they think being at 1 is not that different from being at 3, but it is for the purposes of, of Collective Brutality, and also, I guess, for using their fetch lands. Opponent's going to draw, and what was that? Ah, they Boros Charmed us. Yeah, it's a little annoying when there's a rest in peace on the replay because you don't see what happened until you pull up the Exile tab. But yeah, Boros Charm puts us to five, and Tireless Tracker cannot attack. But guess what? <laughs> we draw an untapped land. We have drawn lands almost literally every draw step. Has it been, has it been like seven out of ten, something crazy like that? Maybe even eight. Uh, like I said, I kind of want to go back and count. But look at this. This is our eighth land, which means we can fire up both hissing quagmires, and our opponent just scoops it up because they don't have a lightning bolt in hand or anything else to kill a quagmire, and they are just facing down lethal even if they throw away their goblin guide. That is just insane. Both of these games were very unique. Um, the first game, again, being unique because we were able to just play through an Eidolon almost like it wasn't there and still somehow win, mainly because Tarmogoyf is OP. And the second game, we flooded like absolutely crazy we only found a tireless tracker near the end and the tracker didn't even do anything it didn't even attack it it just made clues we didn't crack so literally we just won the game well you know to be fair we did have a couple fatal pushes that were necessary we 
our trophy didn't really do much because we took him off white for a minute, then they found it right away, but... And, of course, we had a collective brutality. But all that did is drain them for two. Remember, our discard whiffed, it didn't kill anything. So we had a drain them for two and a couple fatal pushes is pretty much all we did that mattered. And then we just attacked them to death over the course of, of ten turns, beginning, I guess, on turn five, maybe, with two treetop villages and then two hissing quagmires. I mean, if this is not an advertisement for how powerful creature lands can be in this deck, I don't know what is. Um, another very unusual way to win against Burn. Both of these games were pretty unusual, and that's why I thought it would make for a good video. Um, also showed the the power of our deck against Burn, like we, we had some really clunky progressions. We definitely had nowhere near decent draws, let's be honest, overall. We had, to, we had to do some really strange things and really unconventional things. It's not like we're just cleanly inquisitioning cards out of their hand and brutalitying, you know, a, a really high value three for three, like, you know, finding Kalidus. Nothing like that. We're just kind of like, well, I guess we got to attack with two hissing quagmires. Oops, I won. Like, <laughs> and, uh, and part of the reason we were able to do that is just because our deck is so naturally painless. Like... The, the mana base is so painless, and that goes a long, long way toward giving us the buffer we need against Burn to put games away. And uh, honestly, this is a matchup I enjoy. Don't get me wrong, it's still not, not like a great one. Um, they can still really smoke us. They, they ended up with a really clunky hand near the end of this game. I think they probably honestly over-sideboarded. Um, Path to Exile is something that I'm not sure about against us, but, you know, maybe they just kind of need it to deal with our Tarmogoyfs. Fair enough. Rest in Peace might be going a little bit too far. I'm not sure I'm a huge fan of that, and I definitely don't like the Ensnaring Bridge. We, we still play a ton of outs to it, and it's just not a burn spell. Like, if these were both burn spells, we'd be dead. Or even if any two of these three were burn spells, we'd be dead. Um, so, you know... The, the power of our deck, I guess, the power of our threats can compel our opponents to, to sometimes overboard against us, and we can leverage that. But, um, you know, even even when stuff like that doesn't happen, we still have a really solid matchup against Burn, in my opinion. Like I said, better than any other BGX variant um, out there. And that has to do with no Dark Confidants and a very painless mana base. Now that said... The Confidant builds are the ones that have put, been putting up results in the past week. Um, prior to that, you know, as Golgari has started to pick up steam in the meta post-trophy, the results were generally, I guess, about 50-50 between the lower curve Dark Confidant builds and the 25 land Tracker and Tassiger builds like I've been running. Um, who knows? You know, maybe it's just a, a little blip on the radar and and the Tazigar builds will come back, but for the last week or so, it's been the Confidant builds taking it down, so I'm definitely not, not hating on those, and in fact, um, if I can maybe sell enough cards elsewhere, I, c I can get the Confidants I need on here to try some lists for the channel, but until then, I'm still super happy with the Tracker and Tassiker build, and I am confident in saying that it is much better against Burn than a Confidant build would be. Um, Tassiker is not only painless, but also gets around the Eidolon trigger neatly. You know, you can just drop a 4-5 for usually only a couple mana that does not even trigger Eidolon of the Great Revel, and that's really tough for Burn to deal with at the right time of the game. So, anyway, enough said. Um, thank you so much for watching, as always. I hope you enjoyed the content. I hope you enjoyed these two unusual games against Burn that Golgari deck came out on top as we should. And uh, yeah, if you have any feedback about the channel in general, about this video in particular, whether it be sideboarding, lines I took in the game, or, or something to do with my presentation, I am always all ears. And I'm receptive to any feedback, any criticism, you know, lay it on me. I don't bruise easily. So anyway, uh, thanks again for watching. Stay tuned to the channel. More gameplay coming, and I hope you have a great night. I'll talk to you soon.